Panera Bread is a famous place, known for serving comfort food year-round. They have their signature way of making sandwiches, soups, breakfast food, and pasta. It is good food, but it can be a bit overpriced. I work at my local Panera Bread in Cleveland, Ohio, and honestly, it's a decent place to work. People understand that it's a place where you have to pay a little more. Customers have always understood that. Until one day, someone didn't. And it nearly cost me my life. It all started about three months ago. This customer came into our establishment. She looked as though she was out of place. Along with serving comfort food, Panera prides itself on its elegance and calm atmosphere for customers to dine in. This customer seemed too irate and eccentric to be here, but I put on a customer-friendly smile and called her forward. I can help you over here, ma'am. What can I get started for you? What can I get started for you? Do you assume I'm going to pay these prices? I don't make the prices, and if you're not here to eat, our restroom is in the back. The first door on your right. I don't need to use the restroom. I want to eat. I'm happy to serve you. Here are our cheapest meal options. I showed her the menu where our cheapest items were, and she had a look at it. She simply scoffed and walked out. My manager Jake came out just as the woman left in a huff. Is everything okay? I shrugged. She didn't want to eat here, I guess. Weird. Yeah. It was. Hey, Allison. I wanted to tell you that my vacation is coming up in a couple of months. Would you be interested in training to take over for me while I'm gone? Seriously? That would be great. Will I get a pay increase? Only for the time. You're the manager. I'm definitely interested. Perfect. I'll mark you down and we'll start next week. Even though it was while Jake was on vacation, I was excited to take over for him for an entire month. I was saving up for this expensive makeup collection that I wanted, and the manager's salary would help me get it quicker than I thought. I was a fast learner, and thanks to the knowledge I had already acquired, everything was going to be a breeze. Once a week, the same lady would come in. Each time I saw her, she grew more irate and more haggard. She always wanted to come in and eat and she did the same thing every time. She would tell me she was not paying these prices and then walk out. One day, I even tried offering her a meal and she huffed at me, kicked the counter, and stormed out. At that time, Jake had told me that he wouldn't let her back into the restaurant. The next day, when she came in, if I wanted to prove myself ready to take over, I had to be the bearer of bad news. Ma'am, you've been coming here every week, and you're starting to damage our property. We haven't done anything to you, so we have to ask you to leave this establishment and not come back. Her eyes widened, and one twitched out of anger. Are you banning me from coming in before I can even order? That's the problem, ma'am. You don't order. You come in, you have a fit, and when you leave, you upset our other customers. But today I want to buy something. Okay, then what can I get started for you? I want the broccoli cheddar soup, two dinner rolls, and a cup of coffee. All right, that's going to be $12.95. Will you be paying cash or by card? She raised an eyebrow. Does it matter? No, I only ask so I know whether to hit the cash or the card button. She pulled out a $20 bill and gave it to me. I put it in the system and gave the change to her. We prepared her food and we gave it to her. She looked at it and threw the tray onto the floor. Hot coffee and soup splattered all over the place and the dishes shattered. One of the glass fragments scraped a little boy while he was walking by with his mother. He began to cry as his poor little cheek started to bleed. You hurt my baby, the woman cried out. Jake, call the police, I hollered. 
As I went around the counter, the woman was grinning ear to ear. You can't ban me from this establishment. Take this as a lesson. The police are on their way, and you will never set foot in this place again. I turned to the woman and the little boy. I am so sorry this happened. Please sit over there, and I will get the first aid kit. Thank you. Our customers gathered around, asking the little boy if he was okay. Many people offered to pay for their meal. That psycho woman ran out of the restaurant. The cops came, and the mother gave her statement. But they couldn't find the psycho anywhere. The little boy calmed down. When I offered him a free cookie, and we bandaged his wound. I also gave her a gift certificate to bring back with her son to get a free meal, and she took it with gratitude. The woman left with her son, and I truly hoped we'd see them again. They were just sweet, innocent bystanders, and a grown woman's tantrum. I finished out the rest of my shift, and went to go take the trash out before I left for the night. If only I'd known offering to take the trash out for Jake would nearly cost me my life. The sun was going down, and I went back to the restaurant into a dark alley where the dumpsters were. As I approached the large metal box, the lid opened, and out jumped a person who hit me hard in the face. I stumbled backwards, and suddenly, I was slammed into a brick wall. The wind was knocked out of me, and before I could catch my breath, I felt my face starting to burn, as if being slashed by fingernails. She moved so fast, and my brain was trying to process the trauma of everything. I was frozen. I couldn't put up a fight against her. She pushed me to the ground and began kicking my stomach repeatedly. All I could do was double over in pain and cough. A metallic taste began to form in my mouth as blood came out. With a few kicks to my face, stomach, and back, I began to feel nothing. My consciousness was fading. And the last thing I heard was a shriek and the sound of a metal object hitting something. I blacked out, thinking I was officially beaten to death. I woke up in the hospital. I didn't know how much time had passed, but I was hooked up to all kinds of things, from breathing tubes to a heart monitor to an IV. I heard a voice say, she's awake, and then a few minutes later, my parents and my older sister came in. They told me I had been out for a couple weeks. I had suffered severe brain damage and had broken a few ribs, causing internal bleeding. I was taken to the hospital just in time. I had to stay in the hospital while my body continued to recover. Jake and my other co-workers came to see me. Jake told me that he was leaving and he heard a commotion in the alley. When he checked it out, he hit the woman over the head with a crowbar and instantly killed her. He wasn't prosecuted and it was proven an accident. Tears welled up as I thanked Jake profusely for saving my life. A few days before I was cleared to go home, I had a surprise visitor. The woman and her little boy came to see me. We heard what happened and we wanted to come see if you were okay. Oh, it's very sweet of you. I'm glad you woke up. We were so devastated to hear that you had been assaulted. I'm glad that your cute little guy made a full recovery too. Yes, he talks about you all the time. Really? Her expression changed to something more sinister, and I had a horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. Yes, about how you should have died instead of his grandmother. What? What are you talking about? She explained how it was all an act to get free food from Panera Bread. Her mother would come in and start acting crazy, refuse to buy food and all that. Then when the restaurant was ready to ban her, she would give in and buy something. She would throw everything and do something to hurt the boy. And then the mom would get upset and gain sympathy from the other customers and employees. They'd done it at multiple Panera Bread restaurants. While she had me distracted with her confession, her devil of a son was by my IV tube, injecting it with air. 
But at that very moment, my mother came into the room, and they both left. I was safe once again. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm from a rural town in Minnesota called Rest Town, born and raised. My town was quiet and peaceful. With only a couple of hundred people living there, we all knew each other as one large family. Until my senior year in high school, nobody had the slightest idea of where Rest Town was located. And deep down, I enjoyed that mystery. But that December day changed everything. It blew any trace of secrecy and anonymity off my small town, leaving it forever labeled by the national media as Arby's Town. This tragic story began when I was just a kid. For years throughout our childhood, my friends and I frequented Arby's on a regular basis. Rest Town, located in the middle of nowhere Minnesota, didn't have an abundance of hangout spots. So Arby's became our go-to destination, as it was one of the few indoor facilities that offered heat during the blistering cold months when hanging out at the park wasn't an option. Additionally, the lack of adult supervision and occasional free french fries from the manager Mr. Erickson regularly edged out the only other competing destination at our disposal, the library. At 11 years old, my friends and I attended its grand opening, marking the first major franchise to arrive in Rest Town and making us feel like our town was headed down a road of growth and expansion that never came. Our middle school years were filled with sandwich stops after tiresome soccer practices, again, where Mr. Erickson would sometimes offer free soft drinks to me and my group. More recently, my high school years often involved hours of me sitting in a booth, tackling homework and assigned readings. But it was during those middle school years that old Mick first made an appearance. I was 12 years old when I first laid eyes on Mick, adorned in a full cowboy outfit, boots, hat, and all. Even back then, Mick looked ancient. He bore a resemblance that made me think of a sickly and starving Santa Claus. He was thin enough to rouse concern, sporting liver spots throughout his wrinkled, leathery body. But, despite his dilapidated looks, he always wore a bright, though gap-filled, smile. He stood by the Arby's entrance, greeting every patron joyously with a wave and grin. Around his thin waist, a holster hung low, sporting a pair of brightly colored orange plastic guns. Occasionally, he'd bring one out and point it at the sky, pop their plastic caps, and hop up and down, as outlaws often did in cartoons. Mick proceeded to make the Arby's entrance his second home. Not a day would go by when Mick wouldn't be by the entrance door in his cowboy getup, greeting customers. Come snow or rain, holidays or weekends, Mick was always there, shining his gapped smile. As the years went by, Mick became the unofficial mascot of our small town. He embraced the cowboy persona and became universally loved by all. Outsiders driving by Rest Town often stopped by our local Arby's, not for a sandwich or a drink, but for a snapshot with the famous Mick. I always thought the Arby's mascot was an oven mitt, I said one evening to my friend Josh while sitting in our usual booth. We stared out the window at Dancing Mick while sipping on some cold Pepsis. Josh shrugged and continued working on our calculus homework. I always assumed it was a cowboy hat. Why would it be an oven mitt? He replied, staring down at his stack of papers. The question lingered in silence, neither of us interested in the conversation. I stared at Mick. It had been almost six years since his first appearance. Why did he devote so much time to this? At first, I assumed he was a marketing campaign on Arby's behalf, but as the years went by, that idea went out the window. I had a million questions. I arrived at Arby's after school the following week, looking to continue my daily routine of homework and fries when I was greeted by the flashing lights of police cars in the parking lot. I ran inside towards Mr. Erickson, who stared sadly out the window at the development. We got this yesterday. Erickson said to me, not breaking his gaze out the window. He handed me a letter. It was a cease and desist letter from the corporate Arby's offices, made out to Mick. The letter stipulated that Mick had no affiliation with the Arby's franchise, and he was to cease association with the restaurant at once. Failure to do so would result in his arrest. I looked out the window, sadness overcoming me. Outside, Mick was being wrestled to the ground by four police officers, each outweighing him by at least 40 kilos. I won't go, his voice hoarse with desperation. You can't make me go. The police officers lifted Mick's wriggling body and attempted to place handcuffs on him. The screaming continued as onlookers began to gather around the scene. Someone help me, he bellowed, but no one dared to move. At last, a police officer hugged him tightly and brought him to the ground. As Mick's body came down under the weight of the goliath of an officer, his head whiplashed, slamming into the concrete. A sharp noise sounded off, like the cracking of a large egg. 
a soft collective gasp emitted from the crowd. And then, there was absolute silence. Half of the town had shown up for this development, and we all stared as our town icon lay unconscious on the ground. Under his head, a thin river of blood was weaving through the concrete, inching further and further away from its source. He's going to be alright folks, said a policeman, noticing the growing tension in the crowd. A pair of cops linked Mick's unconscious wrist with handcuffs. My stomach churned at this grotesque scene as the river of blood continued to flow. One of the two whispered into his radio, suspect resisted arrest but he is now in custody. Without saying a word, Mr. Erickson walked away, leaving me alone with the image of flashing lights, blood, and disgust on the face of most of the crowd. Weeks passed following that horrible December day, and Mick was nowhere to be seen. Some rumored he was still in the hospital. Others said he had moved away. Some even murmured that he had died from his injury, and the cops hit the news. Regardless, Harvey's wasn't the same without him. That morning, I sat in my booth, annoyed to be doing homework on a Saturday morning, when I spotted him. At first, I didn't recognize him. What walked across the street towards the parking lot looked more like a homeless lunatic than Mick. His beard reached his chest and his hair was greasy, clumped, and of similar length. He wore his usual cowboy outfit with no shirt under, showing his dainty arms and malnourished body. His pants and boots were blotchy with blood. He stared directly at the Arby's, his eyes twitching, deranged. As he approached, various cars and onlookers recognized him. Cheers of, It's Mick! broke out throughout the street as once again, a crowd began to form. Mick seemed unfazed by any of this as he kept walking onward, mumbling under his breath, body twitching unusually. He reached the center of the parking lot and stopped. Behind him, a crowd had beelined and cheers grew. But something looked off. Mick didn't look like himself. He had been replaced by a raging lunatic. I stared from inside the restaurant, confused. In that instant, the sun's light reflected off something on Mick's waist, catching my eye. Where his usual orange plastic guns had sat, his holster supported a pair of silver revolvers. My brain connected the dots, but it was too late. His hands reached for them as gunfire erupted. I threw my body to the ground, peering out the window. The cheers quickly morphed into screams of panic as the crowd broke up, running for their lives. Mick began taking them down like flies. As he did, he screamed into the crowd, but I couldn't make out his words. Tears ran down his face while he gunned down a couple that attempted to escape. He threw the now empty revolvers aside and summed a fresh pair from behind his vest. In a matter of minutes, the parking lot became a wasteland. What had just been a parking lot filled with snow and cheering crowds only minutes before had transformed into a center of death, bloody slush, and agony. In seconds, Countless bodies littered the parking lot, some squirming through the snow, wounded, still seeking refuge. Mick snaked his way through the bodies and headed towards the entrance. Where were the police? Was no one going to help? The entrance door chimed open as Mick stepped in, dripping in blood. His boots echoed loudly on the wood floor as he turned and spotted me. His eyes twitched wildly. He walked towards me, gun in hand. Mick, I gasped. Unable to breathe out of fear. Why are you doing this? Please, we can help you. But the Mick I grew to love was long gone and replaced by this murdering drone. He raised his gun in my direction. Our eyes met momentarily. Two strangers, despite knowing each other most of our lives. Just as the gun went up, it went right back down, dropping loudly on the floor. Mick's entire body followed as he came down face first, landing by my feet. I stared at the back of his head, where a large bullet hole collected blood. In front of me, Mr. Erickson stood, holding a gun. Are you okay? He said in a stern voice. I nodded, mindlessly. The story of Mick made national headlines, and just like that, the anonymity of my town suddenly vanished, replaced by its new reputation of Arby's Town. Some people wish for popularity and fame, but after Mick, all I can hope for is to live under the radar for the rest of my life. When I was a little girl, my mother told me that fear was an emotion that required to be conquered. But in case it was impossible to fight against it, the best solution would be to flee. I never seemed to understand what she meant until three months ago. 
when I finally came across a fearsome situation. But before I start telling you my dreadful story, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mary. When I graduated from high school, I got accepted to a college in another state. I was happy to move out of my family's house as I did not have any patience to put up with my parents' unending fights. At first, I was really happy. I have never felt that free in my life. However, as years passed, I started to face the consequences of my lack of attention to the classes. They warned me over and over again and eventually kicked me out of the college due to the classes I kept failing. I never had the courage to tell my parents about it because I was afraid that they would force me to live with them again. And that was something I did not desire. Because I was not able to stay in the dorm, I had to find a place to live. And to be able to pay the rent, I had to work. I searched for a job and was desperate to find one. I searched the internet, hoping to find a suitable job, but I could not find any. After a couple of days, I ended up being a server in Wendy's. It was my first working experience, so I had a hard time to adjust to having a career. A couple of months passed, and I realized the fact that I got used to working there. Of course, I would get tired time to time, and sometimes rude customers would piss me off. But other than that, I was quite happy working in Wendy's. I was not aware that this beautiful first job experience of mine was about to turn into a nightmare. The day that horrible event occurred was three months ago. It was a busy day, and we were all exhausted as the time of closing arrived. Me and two other co-workers of mine stayed to close the restaurant. One of them was an old man who very rarely spoke to any of us. We did not know anything about him, but he would always gently smile and thank me whenever I helped him. His name was David, and that was actually all the information I had about him. The other one was Liam. He was an extremely thin man in his 30s. He had black bags under his eyes. His skin was dirty and pale. He smelt like a wet dog that had been living inside a trash bin. Even though he was not too wretched looking, looking at him would still give me the creeps. He was a talkative person who enjoyed telling the same stories over and over again. As we were about to close the restaurant, Liam approached me and started to speak as if I was eager to listen to one of his stories. A great sense of boredom filled my heart. I told him that I forgot to clean the bathrooms and walked away. Of course, it was an excuse to get away from him. I went inside the bathroom and started to wait. The bathroom did not need to be clean as I had already done it a half an hour ago. But unfortunately, with Liam around, the bathroom was the only place I could find some peace. As I waited for five minutes, hoping that the others would finish their duties quickly so that I could go home as fast as I could. I heard footsteps coming towards the bathroom. The sound stopped, and I heard a knocking on the bathroom door. It was Liam. He told me that he was bored and that he wanted to speak with me. With a frustrated voice, I said, I am busy. Why don't you go and talk with David? He seemed to not understand or care about my frustration as he replied. Everybody knows that David is not the chatty type. I tried talking with him, but got bored immediately. Also, I really enjoy having conversations with you. I sensed a sudden shift on his tone as he said the last sentence. His voice became unsettling. I did not respond. He started to talk about his life, but his speech topic quickly changed into a sexual life and how good was his performance in bed. While talking, I could hear his deep breathing sound. Obviously, I was disturbed by his speech, and I told him to leave me alone. With a devilish voice, he said, I can show you how good I am in bed if you like me to. Once again, I screamed, leave me alone. My voice echoed in the bathroom. After a couple of seconds, I started to hear banging sounds, as if he was trying to break open the door. Thankfully, I was smart enough to lock the door, but this insane man was still trying to open the door. I cried for help. I screamed as loud as I could, hoping that David might come to my aid. After a while, Liam managed to break the door as he stood there right before me. He locked his eyes on my breasts and grinned. He opened his eyes so wide that I thought they were going to pop out of their sockets. Of course, of course, you want me to please you, my love, he said, 
as he started to approach me slowly. At that moment, I heard the breaking sound of glass, and when I looked behind Liam, I saw David with a broken bottle in his shaking old hand. I realized that David had broke the glass bottle on Liam's head. Although blood was pouring from his head, Liam was acting as if nothing happened. He continued to walk towards me. He grabbed hold of me with the skeleton-like hands. His grip was way more powerful than I expected. I wanted to fight back, but my body was totally frozen. David jumped on Liam and tried to pull him away from me. Liam pushed him so hard that he fell to the ground and hit his head on the floor. I felt like my body was paralyzed. I could not move a single muscle. When I thought everything was over, I heard the sound of my mother in my head telling me to fight back or run away. Following the virtuous advice she gave me when I was a child, I found the strength to snap out of my paralyzed state. I pushed Liam back. He tried to grab me again, but I managed to run away from him. As I ran outside, I heard the police sirens, seeing the blue and red lights shining as the police car arrived in front of the building. I felt a sense of relief. Two officers rushed toward me. Still shook by the recent incident, tears burst out of my tired eyes. I cried and told them what happened. While I was telling them the story, one of them looked behind me and shouted, He is running away! They started to run, and I watched them chase Liam. I watched them as they disappeared into the darkness of the night. After a moment, I heard gunshots. The policemen came back and told me that they got him. Apparently, the police had to shoot Liam nine times before he fell to the ground. I told them that David was lying inside, unconscious. They rushed inside and came out of the restaurant carrying David. He seems to be okay, one of the officers said. They told me that after David heard my screaming, he called the police, and that was the reason they were able to arrive so quickly. I thanked David. I thanked the officers, and I asked them what they knew about Liam. They told me that, considering the way he resisted to the bullets, it was possible that Liam was under the influence of a substance. I resigned from my job at Wendy's the very next day. I called my parents and told them what happened. My father demanded me to return to them immediately. Normally, this would bother me, but after everything I went through, the idea of going back to my parents' house seemed good. I do not know why Liam was acting that way, but according to the police investigation, it is likely that he was a drug addict with an unstable mind. Although I know he is dead, I still wake up at night, seeing him in my nightmares, approaching me and saying, of course, you want me to please you. <laughs>